And now, the story. That morning, he woke up very early. It was a Sunday, a crisp New Mexican winter Sunday. He bet there was what he called the Albuquerque breeze out there. About 70 degrees. Far from hot, just right. It felt like 2 a.m., but looking at his watch, he could tell it's already 4. It's time to get ready. I've got a date with Karma, he thought. He had pumped up so much Daimoku over the last nine months, he felt he'll be more prepared. Wow, I can't imagine what it'll be like if I didn't do any Daimoku. He spoke out loud as he prepared. Jay has been chanting for 36 years. His Buddhist faith has seen him through divorce, bankruptcy, and two cancers. The second he's still dealing with daily. But you see, cancer didn't see the universe coming. Jay was rolled up into the universe, and the universe was rolled up into Jay. Through faith, he shook the karma down. He survived the stage 2 prostate cancer after 40 rounds of radiation and a couple of tubs with several bouts of hematuria. Jay was a strong man when it comes to fighting cancer. He was an Ogun-possessed patient as much as he was a sword-wielding, sutra-thumping samurai warrior. He fought and smiled every inch of the way. Till this moment, he's still smiling and chanting. I'm not shaving. I'm not shaving. Got to look rough. Got to look tough. Seasoned. We should have done those tattoos way back. No tattoos? Why? He had to admit it. He was scared. He was scared like no man's business. He threw his meds in a transparent bag as instructed. Threw on his clean but weathered sweatpants suit. And soon he was feeling warm safe and believe it or not kind of strong kind of secure sentiments he there agrees he needed like heck oh shoot he almost forgot his two volumes of the new human revolution into the duffel bag you go he poured his coffee two drops of stone cold creme creamer and the body started responding to the brain very interesting how they have to play catch up like that you know uh, body and brain. His golden space was a glow, giving him the required confidence. He sat down and began chanting, roaring like a wounded lion as the memories came flooding back like the Okupa River. Jay! Jay! His landlord's voice slowly stared him out of his stupor. Yes, Chris. Yes, Chris, what's that? Oh, nothing, really. Didn't even realize you were sleeping. Sorry, you just wanted to let you know you have a flat tire going down fastly. Chris said in his not too good English. He's from Poland. Fastly, Jay muttered. Okay, I'll be right there, Chris, thanks. He struggled up, wore his jeans. Slapped water all over his face, grabbed his keys, and proceeded to drive the brand new Ford Explorer to his mechanic down the 85A. If he hurries up, he could have it there in 10 minutes. It should still have some air in it. Well, he was wrong. The noisy flapping and grinding metal was too much for fellow road users. They called 911. It was just a matter of minutes before the sirens were blaring. He was pulled over. He was reeking of Merlot. He was coughed. He was charged. He was arrested for DUI. Driving under the influence. A zero tolerance offense in the state of New Mexico. He was released an hour after. Now, nine months after, over $6,000 in the hole, 
attorney's fees, a handful of court visits, and quite a few online traffic school studies. It was finally jail time, a whole nine days. He thought he would be ready, but as is clear as day, nothing can prepare a well brought up person for the trauma of jail time, no matter how short. I know there's something to learn for me in there. He rationalized. It's not like I have a choice. I must not give up. Nine days. What did the Gosha say about days? He paraphrased it in his mind. It takes 12 days to travel from Kamakura to Kyoto. If you stop on the 11th, how can you admire the moon over the capital? This holds true. The name of the jail is Durango, D-U-R-A-N-G-O, Durango. But Jay took artistic license and forced in an I for the influence in D-U-I. Durango was born. He missed the appointed 6 a.m. self-surrender badge. Shit. He started to slowly freak out until it hit him hard. Nobody really cares what you say or feel at this point in time, Jay. You're nothing but a jackass convict getting ready to get locked down. Period. He got it. When he talks so sternly to himself, he usually gets it. It was obviously still dark outside of 56th Avenue. Damn, there was nobody to ask anything. He just had to wait in the car. Hopefully someone would show up, either going in or coming out. Hey, wait a minute, why don't I just call them? That's exactly what he did. And he heard exactly what he deserved to hear. Yes, our entrance cycle is every hour. If you miss the hour, you wait for the next hour. Okie dokie then, he thought. By a quarter of 7 a.m., he had once again packed all his few stuff and sat the transparent bag on the passenger seat beside him. It was one heck of a list. No computers, no electric device of any kind, no toothbrush, no cell phone. Are you kidding me? That's when he knew he was really going to jail. But... He wasn't playing either. He was definitely not Jay the Jazz Man at this point in time. Jay the Jailbird, more like it. Shabbily dressed down, compared to standards. He was definitely looking inconsequential. she easily just mix and mingle. <laughs> at least that's what he thought. In his mind, thoughts were running riot. I have thought a self-surrender would have dignity. Maybe even stop the mental anguish, but nothing, nothing was warm or dignifying about self-surrender. The sleep from freedom to incarceration is in blunt. It's sharp as a razor. It's called surrender for a reason. The second the big black steel door rolled shut behind me, the only thing left was a sky that stretched from the four corners above. This jolted me awake to my new reality. An unexpected blast of vertigo hit me. And I really don't know how I remained standing. Because bearing all odds, I should have just passed out. He was escorted, transparent bag and all, to what looked like an entry post to the southeast of the yard, which looked like it led into yet another vast yard, the size of a football field. He squinted right through all the barbed wire that crowned the impossible heights that surrounded him. He swore the walls were no less than a hundred feet high, <laughs> at least. The strong southwest sun was already smoldering. Then his thing through the barbed wire, sending blinding rays and beams at all sorts of ridiculous angles. He squints back to focus as he hears the officer saying hi to another, coming from the opposite direction that is. Only one self-surrender? 
the other officer asks quizzically. No, late. 1800 report, his escorting officer replied. Jay found it curious how they talked about him rather statistically, paying him no mind. He might as well have been heir. It wasn't long before he discovered that this was the whole M.O. of incarceration. Mental disregard for and of your humanity. You commit the crime, you pay the price. He kept his face deadpan, wondering when he was going to meet his fellow wrongdoers, committers, as they're sometimes referred to. He found out immediately after the thought when he got into the receiving area. There might have been about seven other guests he joined in there. Directly opposite the desk he was taken to was the women's desk. There were about ten women there, all decked in orange jumpsuits. Nobody, nobody spoke in the receiving area. You only speak when you're spoken to. So that explains the silence. What Jake couldn't figure out was why all the prison officers kept talking at high decibels to themselves. More mental pressure, no doubt. It's as if they're treating the whole process with a smirky, we got you now attitude. A couple of days earlier, Jay had called the facility, giving them the heads up that he was coming in on a self-surrender. It was the second call. The first was the mandatory two weeks intent of surrender, during which you are allowed to ask last-minute questions and clarifications, if you will, particularly health-related questions. Trust me, the government doesn't want or need any inmate croaking on them. Jay was audacious for a couple of reasons. One, he had finally come round and accepted a nine-day sentence. It is what it is. Two, his faith had shown him the light. He waited for what looked like eternity and somewhere about 10 a.m. This second point was particularly illustrated justified. The nurse called him up for his medical checkup. As expected, she yelled out his name. That was when Jay realized she was the nurse he spoke to on the phone. Her British accent chimed out loud like the Big Ben. Jamie, you, Joseph, Ofa, Otu Fale. Jay sprang up from his seat and went over to the counter to meet her. That will be your two father, he said in his crisp and confident Nigerian accent. Somehow, subconsciously, he had turned on his charm. And I'm quite sure you're the nurse I spoke to on the phone. Hmm, El Kunfurarai. Oh yes, the Nigerian who grew up in Southwest England. I see your memory serves you well. Um, so. Is the cancer or any of the other comorbidities going to help keep me, keep me, you know, isolated, like in a medical unit or something? She chuckled. And for a second, Jade thought she was the meanest British person in the whole wide world, until she uttered rather point blankly, Trust me, you don't want to be in the medical unit. See that guy in the jeans over there? He's going in for DUI as well. He's a medical doctor. A professional like you. Pray you meet and stay together inside. Next! James Curtis Logan. She yelled out the next inmate's name, subtly dismissing him with a mischievous smile. You'll be alright. It's not that bad. Be over before you know what's happening. The medical assistant tugged at him and asked him to have a seat as he checked on his blood pressure. Jay couldn't take his gaze off the medical doctor who sat about six chairs to the right of him. He slowly chanted in his mind. And now, The Voice. 
What sticks out is the reality of an ugly situation versus the faith to deal with it. Jamu Otufale is drawing on his mind strength and doing well. That in itself is more curious than the misdemeanor. Why? Because what matters most is redemption. Redemption at Duirango. It will appear that he has accepted his karma on this one, yet he suffers a bit from doubt and anxiety. Obviously scheming to use his medical condition to his advantage. That didn't happen. His karma was wrought in bars of steel. The strength of faith is the strength of life. Do you beg to agree or disagree? Jay's faith was often shaken. His thoughts from next week's episode, While in the Holding Cell, says a lot. Take a listen. Have you ever been locked up in a concrete cell? No windows, no ventilation, only a stained, dirty, stainless steel sink and a stainless steel sheet pot loaded with the good stuff. Smells damn good too. The real treat is that the good stuff has been recently used to boldly write on the wall. Yeah. Answer that simple question, yay or nay, and I'll continue my spiel. That's what I thought. No reply. Jay's thoughts were measured and confirmed. He wasn't losing his mind, but was definitely shaken. America, Wariwaka. Yes, it looks like a duck, talks like a duck, and walks like a duck. It's got to be a duck, right? Subconsciously, Jay, by his own incarceration, was writing a story based on attitude, based on faith. He was beginning to prove the truth in the philosophy that the battle is always won when you never give up. Well, let's find out more next week. <laughs> let's keep a date so we can hear some more jail action unfold, some more jail faith expressed, and some more jail lessons learned. If you promise to be here, so would I. This is Jimmy Banks with a story of voice from the Voice Bank. Talk to you soon. Our spoken word this week is joined to our musical notes for the week. It's lyrical, full of confidence, reflected a self-actualization that comes only through faith. I searched for this one too. Remember, only royalty-free music on podcasts. It's from a group called Shangri-La, titled Never Surrender. Stand my ground till the final hour, till the fight is over. Gonna soldier boom, cause I'm an army of one. Gonna feel my power till the fight is over, till the fight is over, till the fight is over. I'll never surrender. My peeps of the week are the Inside Gang, the yellow house on Calabar Street, circa mid to late 80s, when we could all feel the wheel of life turn our way. Thanks, Stevie. My appreciation starts right from the top. Sasha B, the main man, Vale, Mr. Ushika, Afume, Fumionobulu, Vio, Vincent Oyo, Brostuns, Tunde Gunlaye, Omonode, Udebe Ufot, Gru, Wale Lauye, Omone Bwax, George Bwakoke, Julia, Bugwames, Baby Sage, 
Amon Evru, Longly Evru, Alaji, way too many wonderful warriors. Insight was and still is a watershed in many a history books. Hottest and baddest in Nigeria's ad lad. Not going down. Gonna stand my ground till the final hour, till the fight is over. Go on, soldier, go on, cause I'm an army of one. Gonna feel my power till the fight is over. I'll never surrender, not going down without a fight. I'll never surrender, cause I was born to stay alive. I'll definitely struggle and mostly unravel. It's never over until it's over. I'm not going under. There's a strength in me, got no defeat. I'm a survival. Again, it's been nothing but a delight to be here as usual. If you promise to be here in another fortnight, I'll be here too. Then we can continue our curious trip into the mind of the man. J. Do you rango part two is coming your way. Until then, as they say in one of the several tribes I love, Tojuiwe, keep your character.